The history of capturing motion began already in 19th century with photography pioneer Edward Mybridge, who used multiple cameras to record movement as a sequence of images. His groundbreaking experiments with multiple cameras demonstrated how movement could be broken down in precise frames, laying the groundwork for modern motion analysis and visualization. Today we apply the same principles in much more advanced ways. 4D Gaussian splatting allows us to capture and reconstruct motion as a volumetric video using modern multi-camera rigs. This cutting-edge technique builds on MyBridge's legacy, transforming how we record and experience movement in the digital age. But even if you don't have access to such complex and expensive camera equipment, you can try producing 4D GS virtually on your own computer. Let me tell you how. Hello boys and girls, it's Olli here again. Today we are diving into the world of moving Gaussians. I've been researching this topic a bit lately and now I want to show you what it takes in practice. As we have already learned a lot of from my previous videos about 3D Gaussian splatting and how static models can be produced, now we are going to explore what we need to do to be able to add motion to them. Time is often considered as the fourth dimension and therefore this has this interesting name 4DGS. But we can also talk about animated Gaussian splatting, volumetric video, moving or dynamic splats. The term has many names and they sound very fancy, but the essence of the matter is ultimately very simple. In the same way that an animation or a video can be dismantled into image sequences, same way the PLY files produced by the Gaussian splatting process are created as series in here. So basically we are creating animation frames where each frame consists of 3D data of a Gaussian model. Most shots program latest version supports now these kind of sequences and is able to display them straight on its own timeline. Let me now show you a very simple trick that anyone who has produced Gaussian splatting models with post shot can try and produce animated PLY sequences. Here I have a simple model of a scanned airplane. It is a static model that has already been cropped out of its environment using the crop box feature. Now I will start making a small changes to it. The idea is to create an animation where the ground level below the airplane is wiped away in a spiral motion. For this I will use the selection circle tool and paint some splat away from this corner here. After this I will export the model as plane001.ply. Then I will continue to remove the splats a little further and again I will save the model as a PLY file, this time as a plane002. And again the same steps, I paint and delete more splats and now I save the file as a 003 and so on and so forth. Now I will speed up the process a little and proceed with the deleting the splats. I erase areas in a spiral direction until most of the ground under the plane is removed. And for each step I saved a new PLY frame. So when I finish the process I have a total of 22 PLY files that are numbered in order. Then I clear the post shot and open a completely new base. When I go to the explorer window and select all the PLY files and simply drag them back here into the post shot, 
It takes a moment and the Gaussian model of the plane opens as it was in the beginning. It may seem like nothing happened, but if we set the last frame setting here to 22 and start drag the Q point on the timeline, we see that the animation we created is happening in the post shot view. We can now also press the play button and the animation will start to play on its own. And while it is running, we have the option to rotate the model to different angles, same time as the animation is playing. This is how the animation feature works in PostShot at its simplest. Of course, this is certainly not the kind of a dynamic splat we wanted to see, and if we look closely at the file sizes, we see that it is not very practical either. The PLY files are each over 200 megabytes. And naturally, they get smaller as the splats are removed from the model. But in any case, we can see that PLY sequences can grow really big and heavy. And on the other hand, it also requires more VRAM memory. So I guess we want to build a more convenient animation with a more optimized file size. And for that we can open a Blender software and try to render the datasets for synthetic 4D Gaussian splatting models. I will show you now a sneak peek at the upcoming update through the camera array tool that I have developed. I have made several new features for it, including a new 4D GS generator that will make the workflow for creating animation frames easier. As I have introduced in previous videos, my camera array tool add-on allows you to create camera setups on the surfaces of any object. This works best around individual 3D models, such as various characters or whatever 3D object you might want to put inside it. And these arrays represent kind of a virtual capture studio that can be operated in Blender. So here at the bottom of my add-on, I have now a new section called Animated 4D GS Data. Through this we are able to render images of each frame. But before we can start, we should set the timeline settings to correct values. Since this camera rig produces so many images for each frame, we don't want to render any unnecessary images. Here I have this Batman character, and it has this running loop animation set onto it. We need to watch and test carefully where this animation will actually loop. It seems that this loop is 18 frames long. Now I determine the output folder, where all the data will be rendered. And in this 4GGS section, I can activate whether I want to use the call map data. It means that camera array tool will also generate the point cloud and the camera position data from each frame within the same directory where the images will be rendered. And for the point cloud, I need to choose also the animated object which in this case is the running character. This means that a script will generate a point cloud from each position where the character is on each frame. And now that everything seems to be okay, I can press Generate 4G GS Animation button, and the Blender starts its rendering process. From the file explorer, I can see that camera array tool will create a folder for each frame, and in those folders it will first render images from all cameras. And at the end, it will add also the call map files in each folder. Those are these three TXT files that will later help us in PostShot and make the Gaussian training faster in there. And since this Batman running loop was 18 frames long, when the rendering is complete, we should have a total of 18 frames folders ready in our output directory. All these folders are ready to be imported to PostShot, 
and we can of course start to do the Gaussian training manually. But making all 18 PLY files separately like this is very tedious and time-consuming task. So what could help on this? What could be a solution to how we could automate this training step for each frame? Fortunately, the developer of PostShard has noticed this and created a version of the PostShard program that can be controlled from the command line. This is called PostShard CLI program and it can be found in the folder where PostShard is installed on your computer. From the command line you can issue the same commands as if you were using the desktop program itself. It is more efficient and faster because we don't have to keep the user interface window visible. But writing the command lines can be quite confusing and even for them you eventually need to create some kind of a script to really automate this step. But don't worry. I have solved this problem and I have developed a simple batch rendering script in Python code. I have also made it more user-friendly and created a user interface window like this. It's not very pretty but it does the job. So in this batch renderer you just need to choose the input folder which is the source folder where our recently rendered frame folders are located. And then we need to determine output folder where we want to save our PLY files. After this we can set how many iteration steps we want to take in action for each frame. I'm setting this to very low level for now. I will train only 5k iteration steps to make the process faster. And then I can also give my PLY file a prefix name here. Since I know that these synthetic models with data that is created in Blender works best with the ADC profile, I will choose that rather than the default MCMC. And then I just press the Generate PLY Sequence button. This batch renderer application starts its work and we can monitor the progress of the training more closely from the command prompt window. Script will check how many numbered folder it can found in the directory we gave and then it launches the PostShot to do its Gaussian training for them. And when the training is ready it saves the PLY files in the output directory with the sequence number in their names. This batch renderer application is designed to speed up the 4DGS calculation and it saves you a lot of manual work. But I also have to mention a problem I have encountered when using PostShot from the command line. Occasionally PostShot may crash and give an error during the process. This often happens when it starts saving a PLY file. The problem is not so much in the script but in the PostShot itself. And that is understandable since PostShot is still in beta development and such errors may occur. However, I have designed my batch renderer to be a failsafe so that if the process is interrupted for some reason, you can continue by pressing the generate button again. The script checks which PLY files have already been made and then continue from there. This way you don't have to start the process from scratch. I'm sure that in the future version this will be fixed and the PostShot command line trainer will become even better and more stable. But now that we finally have all the PLY files ready, we can drag them back into the PostShot and see what our 4DGS animation looks like. So congratulations, we have just succeeded in creating a synthetic anime Gaussian splatting of a character that was rendered in Blender. But wait, where can I use these animations then? Can I save or share them in anywhere? I would say that that is a very good question. 
This is the funny aspect of this whole thing. At the moment, there aren't many uses for animated Gaussian models. Supersplat has just announced that their latest version, 1.15, also supports these PLY sequences. And you can drag your PLY files there in the same way. Unlike in PostShot, in Supersplat you can play with the FPS setting and thus adjust the speed at which the animation is displayed. But really, that's about it. It seems that you can't save animation to any single format yet. PostShot and Supersplat only offers a playback feature for displaying these animations. You can save PostShot to its own native PSHT format, but when I tried to open it in, for example, After Effects, the animation doesn't appear there at all. It only shows the single frame from it. And now that the latest version of the PostShot also supports the Unreal Engine, I tried this feature also in there, but even worse success. When I drag the PSHD file in Unreal, I can't even get the whole model to appear, even though the latest plugin seems to be installed correctly. So this is the situation now with these PLY sequences. These features are currently so fresh and new that there is not many opportunities with them yet. 4DGS seems interesting, but the real-life use cases where they really could be taken advantage of are still very vague, at least at the moment of making this video. Overall, volumetric video can only be a very short clips, and th that is understandable when we consider how much data is in one frame. We will eventually need a decent compression method for these sequences, something familiar to what is already used in video compression. Gaussian models should be optimized with the same principles that only moving splats are taking into account, and everything else that remains stationary does not produce additional data. Fortunately, it seems that there is already ongoing research underway on this dynamic Gaussian compression, and it will be interesting to see what kind of a practical application it will produce in the future. The year 2025 is just beginning, and I believe that very soon we will have either new formats or application where we can properly utilize the 4DGS functions. In the meantime, you can already practice this process. I hope that I could soon have the latest version of my camera array tool ready. The current version, though, is available in my Gumroad online store, and you will benefit from this purchase because everyone who has already bought this add-on will get the update for free in the future. So stay tuned, I will publish a more detailed tutorial video once the new update is fully ready. As for the batch renderer I have built, you can download it, it for free. I will put the links in the description. Well, that was a lot of topics in one video. Tell me what you think of 4DGS and what uses you see for it. Leave a comment below. I hope this was useful and gave you some practical tips on what 4DGS is currently. If you like the video, hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. I will continue to act as a modern day Edward Mybridge and delve deeper into my research. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.